Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It's the second Sunday of the season of Lent. Welcome also to those joining us online this morning. Just a few announcements about our life together before we worship. A um, season of Lent is underway. Um, on Wednesdays during the day, we do have an opportunity to gather together. Um, this Wednesday will be at Holy Family Episcopal Church again. It's at noon. Um, it's one hour in length, a simple lunch of soup and bread, followed by a brief worship um, and some conversation together about the, one of the texts from today. Um, we'll move to St. Peter's on March 15th. Um, I believe we have all of the soup and bread covered, so thank you to those who signed up to help with that. There are still a few devotional books left for the season of Lent out on the table on the way out this morning. We are in a series um, called Ask about questions and thinking about questions. Um, in our liturgy this morning, again, will be different than perhaps what you're used to, um, but meaningful, I hope, nonetheless, as we think about questions of our faith. As we prepare for Easter, just a reminder, we have flowers every year, and if you have a mailbox out on the, in the lobby, that envelope for Easter flowers should be in there. Um, there are also a few extras on the table on the way out. Um, flower orders are due April 2nd. We had two collections that are ongoing. The first is Christmas in July. We're collecting winter items um, right up through July 23rd that we'll give um, to organizations this summer. And also we're continuing to collect diapers, size one through six, and wipes as we prepare to open our diaper pantry ministry this spring. Um, and also those plastic grocery bags can be dropped off as well. And a reminder, we'd have an outdoor collection bin at the other entrance. If you'd like to take a flyer or a few flyers run off, if you'd like to spread the word or give it to someone you know, um, information about it as well is on the table. A reminder to our congregation, we do have a scholarship here at St. Peter's, so anyone um, going to secondary education, uh, I remind about that application. It's on the table in the lobby. Those are due April 30th. Anyone considering going to camp, please make that registration soon um, before they fill up at camp. This morning, our Chimes players are playing for us, so thank you in advance for bringing music to us in our service today and for Chris for leading the Chimes. We will have cake after worship this morning. We're welcoming the Milligan family as new members of our congregation, and so celebrate cake afterwards and fellowship. And finally, a reminder, this snuck up on me last night. I realized that next Sunday morning is daylight savings time, so spring forward. Um, next week or else you'll be an hour late to church and we'll kind of wave at each other as we go by. So a reminder, daylight savings times begin, daylight savings begins already next Sunday. With that, let's worship together. I invite you to stand as are able for confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who journeys with us these 40 days and sustains us with the gift of grace. Amen. When God made us, God knew what we needed to thrive. God made the earth creative and abundant, and God gave us partners for the planting, for the harvest, for the meal. But when God gives us an orchard, we hunger for more. Please join me as we confess our sins together. First consider, where have you gone wrong this week? How have you harmed your relationship with God, with your neighbor, and with yourself? Now we confess our sins together. We know we have harmed each other and damaged our relationship with you. But we fear that admitting our sin will only drive us deeper into isolation. So we sneak a bite from the fruit that is not ours to take. Then we throw away the evidence of our disloyal decisions. We create distractions to hide what we have done. We point our fingers at the faults of others. We interrogate those who have no reason to lie, and we avoid you. God, you are perfect and holy, but we are imperfect and lonely. And you know we have broken trust, abandoned faith, invested in lies. You always discover the wreckage that bears our fingerprints, and our shame feels more intimate than your love. 
What have we done? Is it too late to receive your forgiveness? Friends, even when we sin, God does not accuse. God only asks what we have done so we can set down our guilt. And God only asks where we have gone because God wants to bring us back. Jesus died to reveal the limitless depth of God's love. You can doubt this love, but you can never change the truth of it. God knows all and forgives all. The only question that remains is whether we can accept love so freely given. We do. We embrace your mercy, and we thank you, God. Amen.
This time I invite the Milligan family and also Del Vogel up front. Milligan will be officially joining our congregation, but I think many of you know they've um, been with us for a while and participating in um, activities and worship for quite a while as well. And so we officially welcome them as new members. And so I invite you to face the screen so you can follow along. Dear friends, we give thanks for the gift of baptism and for this family, one with us in the body of Christ, who are making public affirmation of their baptism. I present Brad Milligan. Mika Milligan, Asher Milligan, and Henry Milligan, who desire to make public affirmation of their baptism. Let us pray. Merciful God, we thank you for these sisters and brothers whom you have made your own by water and the word in baptism. You have called them to yourself, enlightened them with the gifts of your spirit, and nourished them in the community of faith. Uphold your servants in the gifts and promises of baptism and unite the hearts of all whom you have brought to new birth. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen. And now I ask the four of you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church, to renounce the devil and all the forces that defy God, I to renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God, Renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God. I now joined by the congregation, I ask you believe in God the Father. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, only Son of the Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died in the Spirit. And you believe in God the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You made public profession of your faith. Do you intend now to continue in the covenant God made with you in holy baptism, to live among God's faithful people, to hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Christ through word and deed, to serve all people following the example of Jesus, and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth? And people of God, do you promise to support these sisters and brothers and pray for them in their life in Christ? Now let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, that through water and the Holy Spirit you give us new birth, cleanse us from sin, and raise us to eternal life. Stir up in Brad, Kika, Asher, and Henry the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Now I do invite you to turn around because we are going to rejoice and welcome you. Let us rejoice with the sister and brothers in Christ. We rejoice with you in the life of baptism. Together we will give thanks and praise to God and proclaim the good news to all the world. Let's welcome the Milligans. you all. Asher, you're welcome to stay up front because it's children's sermon time, unless you don't want to. That's purely your decision. So our children are invited up front for a message now. I'm going to move this way a little bit, make some room at that. All right, good morning. Ari, you can slide in a little closer if you want. You can slide a little closer if you want. Oh, okay. All right, so I was wondering this morning, um, if you're ever in, I think most of you are either in school or preschool or some setting where you're with other kids and a teacher or other adult, um, if you ever have a question of an adult, what's one thing you might do if you have a question? 
Yes. Yes, you raise your hand just like giving an answer sometimes too, right? So you might raise your hand. Um, do adults, most adults in your lives generally answer your questions? Get some head nods. Yes. Um, sometimes no, sometimes yes. Sometimes no and sometimes yes. That's a fair answer, I think. Um, yes? And sometimes your friends um, answer your questions. Ah, yes, sometimes friends answer questions. That's true. We have friends who might know the answer for us. If you ever have a question about God, First of all, anyone ever have questions about God? Or do you, have, do you all know the answers about God? Do we know everything there is to know about God? If you ever had a question and you were able to think, you know, I have this question, what would you do if you had a question about God? Any ideas? Yes? Check in the Bible. Check in the Bible, yeah, that would be a good thing to do. We could look, look around in the Bible, see. Any other ideas? What we would do if we had questions? All right, so we're going to check in the Bible. Do you think there might be people we might ask? Maybe Sunday school teachers? Maybe pastors? Maybe parents? Grandparents? Yeah, there's all kinds of people we could ask. Is it okay to ask questions about God, do you think? Yeah. It is. Do you think adults ever have questions about God? They do, yes. Some of them might not admit it, but we all have questions about God, I think. And sometimes, sometimes we're afraid to ask the questions about God, but um, our gospel reading, which we'll hear in a few minutes, while we're in Sunday school, we're going to listen to a man named Nicodemus talking to Jesus. And Nicodemus is going to listen to Jesus, but he's going to have some questions too. He's going to ask those questions. And Jesus tries to answer them, but Nicodemus, at least from what we hear in this reading, still has questions even when this is done. Um, it's a reminder to us that it's okay to ask questions, always. Um, I remind our confirmation students all the time that it's okay to ask questions in class, and so I encourage that. And so I want to encourage you to always know that it's okay to ask questions about God. None of us knows everything about God. But we still trust God, right? We can still trust God without knowing all the answers. Um, and at the end of this reading, we hear Jesus talk about God's love for us, that God loved the world so much that he gave Jesus into the world to die on the cross and rise again for us. Um, and so we might have questions about that, but at the end of the day, um, that is God's gift of love to us. So let's hold our hands and pray together. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks for your love for us through Jesus. Help us to remember that we can ask questions about you, and even if we never fully understand you, you will still always love us. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming up. You can go back to your seats or to Sunday school this morning.
preserve you from all evil and will keep your life. The Lord will watch over you. The second reading is a reading from Romans. What then are we to say was gained by Abraham, our ancestor, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he was something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, not to one who works. Wages are not reckoned as a gift, but as something due. But to one who without works trust him who justifies the ungodly, such faith is reckoned as righteousness. For the promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath but where there is no law, neither is there a violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of God, in whom we believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I thought I knew a lot about my faith. 
When I was growing up, my family was in church almost every week. I started Sunday school when I was three and went almost every week until I graduated from high school. I was confirmed after taking two years of catechism classes. When I went away to college, I found the Lutheran campus ministry on site, and that became my church home away from home. And after I graduated from college, I was right back in my home church, attending again almost every week. If you had asked me if I thought I knew a lot about my faith, I imagine I would have said yes. But then a few later, years later, I went to seminary. When I went to my classes, it was like someone had turned on a fire hose of information. I encountered words and ideas I did not understand. I learned things about the Bible I never knew before. Some days I sat in class thinking everyone else knew far more than I did. Today in our Gospel passage, a man named Nicodemus comes to visit Jesus. Nicodemus was a Pharisee, meaning he belonged to a particular group of Jewish believers, a group often portrayed as opponents of Jesus. He was also a religious leader in his community. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, which could mean that he did not want to be seen. And he may have had good reason for wanting that. Some of the religious leaders at that time were quite hostile to Jesus. So it may have been dangerous for Nicodemus to be seen talking with Jesus. This detail could also be the Gospel writer's way of symbolizing that Nicodemus had yet to believe in Jesus. Regardless, Nicodemus is described going to Jesus at night. And it's not clear exactly why Nicodemus went. Maybe he was curious about something Jesus did or said. Maybe he wanted to learn more about who he was. It might even be that he had questions for Jesus. But initially, Nicodemus seems confident in what he knows or thinks he knows about Jesus. Nicodemus begins by declaring, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. It seems that Nicodemus, having seen some of the signs that Jesus was doing, is confident in who Jesus is. But Nicodemus will soon realize there is much he does not yet understand. Jesus tells Nicodemus, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And with that, the questions begin. How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus tries to explain more about what it means, but Nicodemus still doesn't quite understand, and he asks, how can these things be? Maybe Nicodemus didn't know as much as he thought he knew. Jesus even asked him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Some have read this verse as Jesus shaming or even insulting Nicodemus. But I wonder if instead Jesus was simply pointing out to Nicodemus, maybe there is a lot he doesn't yet know. When I went to seminary, I realized there was a lot I did not know about our faith. But not all of us go to seminary or take courses in theology, and yet most, if not all of us, either have or experience something, have or will experience something, it causes us to realize there is so much we don't know about our faith. We may go through something or experience something that causes us to ask questions about our faith. Maybe we experience a tragedy in our lives or know someone who has. Maybe we're shaken by events in our community, our nation, or our world. We may go through a change that we weren't really expecting. We may have a sense of dissatisfaction with our life or wonder about our purpose in life. Experiences like these can cause us to realize there is a lot we don't know. They can cause us to ask questions. We may find ourselves with Nicodemus wondering, how can these things be? 
Of course, this could also come from a sense of curiosity about our faith. Maybe something happens that gives us a newfound sense of wonder about our faith. Maybe we discover something that surprises us about our faith, leaving us to realize there is, again, so much we don't understand. In this case, again, we may find ourselves wondering with Nicodemus, how can these things be? Regardless of how it happens or when, there's nothing wrong with realizing we don't understand it all. There's nothing wrong with realizing we do not fully understand God or God's ways. There is room for questions in our faith. There's room for us to ask God, how can these things be? Whether we're new believers or lifelong believers, whether we go to church all the time or just occasionally, whether we've had a relatively trouble-free life or a life full of challenges, there is room for us to ask God, how can these things be? And when we do ask, we may also hear Jesus extend the invitation he gave to Nicodemus. When Jesus asks Nicodemus, are you a teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? I wonder if he's inviting Nicodemus to set aside the things he thinks he knows to set aside his assumptions, and to open himself to understanding God perhaps in new ways, and to follow Jesus someplace new. Pastor Justin Kosek suggests that in asking this question, Jesus is giving Nicodemus something to think about, a to-go question, if you will, to take with him that he might use later to further reflect on what Jesus said. Because clearly Nicodemus has some things to think about. Clearly he already has questions if he didn't have them before he got there. He's already asked three of them in this conversation. And now Jesus invites him to keep the questions coming. And to invite, keep reflecting on what Jesus has said. And even if Nicodemus doesn't understand at all, Jesus' words assure him that there is nothing that will change God's love for him. Like Nicodemus, we may have questions, some of which may seem simple, some of which may seem complex, but there is nothing wrong with any of them. And regardless of our questions, Jesus speaks words of reassurance to us. The words are familiar to many, for God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. And then Jesus continues saying, Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus came not to condemn, but to save. Which means he certainly isn't going to condemn us for asking a few questions. In fact, I wonder if we can imagine Jesus inviting us just as he invited Nicodemus. And yet, you, child of God, do not understand these things. And can we imagine Jesus taking us by the hand, showing us his ways, and inviting us to experience his love, whether we fully understand it or not? And we don't know how Nicodemus responds to Jesus' questions or his invitation. Nicodemus only appears in John's Gospel, and this is the last we hear of him until chapter 7. When he asks the question of the Pharisees, a question that appears to stand up for Jesus. But he appears again after Jesus' death and resurrect after his death, I should say, after Jesus' death to go with Joseph of Arimathea to anoint the body of Jesus. We will never know if his questions were answered. We will never know if he followed Jesus. Those are questions we may never be able to answer. We too have been invited to follow Jesus, regardless of how much or how little we understand about our faith. Because when Jesus invites us to follow him, he invites us to abandon our certainty, ask our questions, and put our trust in him. And no matter how much or how little we understand, his love for us never, ever changes. Amen.
Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. O oh God, you so love your church. Raise up leaders who care for your people. Bless lay theologians, seminary and college professors, and all who are called to the ministry of teaching, that they form and inspire us for the work of the gospel. Merciful God. O oh God, you so love your creation. Breathe new life into our planetary home. Guide the work of researchers, scientists, and activists who love your earth and who inspire us to care for the, natu <coughs> for the natural world. Merciful God. O oh God, you so love the world. Uphold leaders who resist tyranny and oppression. Strengthen organizations that promote peace and harmony. Direct their work to alleviate human suffering and to address its root causes. Merciful God. Receive our prayer. O oh God, you so love your people. Draw near to all who live with mental illness, depression, or addiction, and accompany them in healing and recovery. Hear the cries of those who look to you in their distress especially those on our prayer list and those we name before you in our hearts. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O oh God, you so love your children. Bless the young in our midst and delight us with their joy, wonder, and curiosity. Revive our ministries with children and youth and equip us all for faithful discipleship. Merciful God, receive our prayer. O oh God, you so love your saints. As our ancestors in the faith have been a blessing to us, so inspire us by their example of holy living to be a blessing for those who come after us. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We lift our prayers to you, O oh God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Please share a sign of that peace with one another in ways that are comfortable to you. pray together. God, what will you do with these gifts? We may never know, but we carry a faith passed to us through generations. We set the table with food and drink, harvested by many hands. 
we break the bread of answered prayers. Use the gifts we give today to grow tomorrow's mercy. Amen. Where is our God? Where are your hearts? What shall we do in the presence of our God? It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Receive 
God's love for us in a way we can touch, taste, and see. You may be seated.
body of Christ given for you. stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen.
peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.